You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. All right, welcome back, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Thinking Talmudist Podcast and class, of course. All of our podcasts are live classes. That's the secret here. The secret is I can't talk straight to a microphone. I can't talk to a microphone. I need to talk to human beings. Look, so it's first a class and secondary. It's on video. It's on Zoom. It's on podcast. But I need you know human beings to learn with uh, that help me focus and help me grow in in my learning. It's all a selfish endeavor here. You know that, right? So it's for me to grow and to learn. And we're all on this journey together. Hopefully, so the Gemara now discusses the rules for administering two charities mentioned. Previously, in passing, in now we're in tractate Baba Basra, eight B. We started last week in eight A. Tana Rabbanon, the rabbis taught in a brisa. Kupa shalt stock on nigves b'shnayim. Contributions to the charity box are collected by two people. Umischalek es b'shlosha, and funds are distributed to the poor by three people. So two people to collect, three people to distribute. The brisa elucidates its ruling. Nigves Bishnaim contributions are collected by a delegation of at least two people. Sheein Osin Shuror Sal Tzibur Pachos Mishnaim. Why? Because there's a known principle that re- with respect to monetary matters, we do not establish an authority over the public consisting of less than two people. I Meaning you can't put a tax on people with less than two people. One person can't say, well, this is going to be a tax, and it has to be at least two people. But when the funds are distributed to the poor people, it's distributed by a panel of three. Bidini Mamonos, for the distribution of charity funds, it is treated like all monetary laws. Okay, so now the Gemara continues, the Brisa continues. Tamchoi Nigves Bishlosha Mischalekes Bishlosha, for the communal platter, which we mentioned last week, mentioned that there's the platter and there's the charity box. There's certain qualifications that get someone into the platter and someone some that get people into the charity box. That is collected by three and is distributed by three. Shegibuya vichiluka shavim for its collection and its disbursement are on the same day. People collect the money, they give the money, and that's that's the way it works. So the Bryson now presents distinctive laws of the charity box and of the platter. The communal platter, which is the food that's given out like a soup kitchen, was dispersed once each day to paupers who lacked provisions for the next day. Kupa, but the charity box, that was distributed one week from Friday to Friday. And paupers who had food for several days but needed additional money to feed their families for the rest of the week would receive supplemental funds from the charity box. Tam olam. Again, the communal platter provides food for any poor person who would, who would come. And kupa laniyeheir, but the charity box, which provides larger sums of support, that would be accessible only to the poor of that city. Paupers who were residents of the city received weekly cash stipends to provide for their families for the entire week. But if you were not a member of that community, if you were not a resident of that community, then every community is responsible for themselves. Go to your community. Your community should help you with your with your needs. But uh, a community was not responsible to help members of a different community who were paupers. Again, if it was a daily thing, they came to the soup kitchen, that's one thing. But if they needed more more funds to help with their children's, you know, lunches for school and things like that, you think, you know. So now we have to understand that the Torah is very, very concerned about us helping those who are needy. It's a very big responsibility that we have and the Torah charges us with this responsibility, that we need to ensure that the poor people are taken care of. And we see this in the Torah, we see this in all of the Mishnah and the Talmud, that there are, there are standards put into place of how we handle 
poverty in our community. The Brysa teaches that transferring money between the funds was permissible. And the officials of the city are authorized to render the charity box a platter. And the platter, a charity box if necessary, meaning because it's all charity funds, if this one needed more funds than that one, then you can cross them over between one to the other. It's fine. The Brysa adds a general rule. That they are authorized to divert excess charity funds to any purpose that they desire. If there's no longer a need for funds in the charity box, so they can move those funds to another cause in the community. It means once it's, I, I, let's put it into, into a framework here. We're not talking about 501c3 and IRS regulations here. We're talking about halacha, the laws of the Torah. Once the money is charity designated, it doesn't need to be exclusively for that charity. It's meant for the public. People are donating it for the public use. So now, if it's not used anymore, like for example, if a 501c3 or a charity was disbanded, what do you do? You don't take that stuff, the chairs, the furniture, and keep it for yourself. You give it to another charity. That means once it's designated for public, it stays in the public. Okay, for public use. The Brysa concludes by enumerating other powers of the communal leaders. V'rashoyim b'neir l'hatsnos al hamidos. And the city officials are authorized to stipulate regarding the measures, and regarding the prices, and regarding the laborers' wages, and the officials are further authorized to fine those who transgress their trip stipulations, meaning if someone doesn't pay the taxes, right, the city has the right to penalize them. Right, that's that's the way it works in our city. Where did they get that from? They get that from, from our Torah. And here the commentary says, who's they? They are allowed to impose stipulations. They is, again, a minimum of two people. Okay, a minimum of two people. The Gemara teaches the source of, of an earlier ruling that we spoke about. Oh, my, my, the master stated uh, stated previously, We do not establish an authority over the public consisting of less than two people. Right? We mentioned that previously, remember? Right at the beginning. Where do we know this from? Again, everything we talk about, everything we mention needs to be sourced. Anybody who tells you that, oh, it's just the rabbis made up rules because whatever, they pulled it out of a hat, they wanted to make our lives miserable, is ignorant and doesn't know what they're talking about. Everything is sourced in the Torah. Where's the source for this? Omar Rab Nachman, Omar Kro, Rab Nachman says, it's a verse in the Torah. And they will take the gold. Who's they? Why they? They means two or more. When they were collecting the tax for the tabernacle, who collected it? They. It was two or more. Scripture refers to the officials that collected donations from the public for the construction of the tabernacle, and it stated they in the plural. This teaches that with respect to money matters, we may not establish an authority over the public consisting of one individual. There always has to be two people collecting, two people who have oversight. That's why in an organization you need to have three people in an organization, right? By law in the United States, to have a 501c3 nonprofit, you need to have three officers because you're going to be collecting money and you're going to be dispersing money. There needs to be oversight for it. That's precisely why and that's the source for it. The Gemara infers from this ruling Shuroros who velo delo avde. It is an authority that we do not make of one individual. Ho haimune mehemen. But with regard to trusting an individual, he would be trusted to serve as the administrator of the charity fund. Misayela Rab Chanina, this inference supports. Right, So giving it out, he's saying, giving it out. You could trust one person. And he brings a, a, a proof from Rav Hanina. 
Domer of Hanino or Hanina says, Masa Vimino Rebbe Shne Achin Alakupa. It was once happened that Rebbe appointed two brothers to serve as the administrators for the charity fund. Concerning matters of trust, two brothers are regarded as one individual. Right? Like two witnesses, if they're brothers, then they're, they're only counted as one witness. For one may not testify against the other. Hence, it was as if Rebbe appointed one person to administer the charity fund. Okay. Now, the Gemara stated above that collecting from the charity box must be performed by at least two because one individual may not be appointed in authority over the public. The Gemara now inquires, My Shurusa, what element of authority does collecting donations for the charity fund entail? I mean, we make a, 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 a make a campaign. We're raising money for public funds. We're raising money for a community need. So, what type of authority is that? The Gemara replies: The Amar of Nachman Amar Rabba Baravua. There is nevertheless an element of authority for Rav Nachman said in the name of Rabba, the son of Avua. Because collectors are authorized to seize a pledge from an unpaid charity obligation. And even, what is that referring to? We'll see in a second. And even on Sabbath Eve, their function entails an exercise of authority. And so, too, collectors must be assigned to this task. Okay, what does this mean? Has the, when every Jew has the excuse that he is busy preparing for Shabbos and therefore cannot tender his contribution. Okay, everyone is busy. There's, there's a known, one of the laws in the Torah is that someone who is involved in a mitzvah is not obligated to a mitzvah. Ha'osik be mitzvah patum in a mitzvah. If I'm busy doing a mitzvah right now, preparing for Shabbos, I'm not obligated in another mitzvah. All right, so here, because they will need to collect charity from, they're going to need to uh, use their authority, you need to have two people. The Gemara objects to Rav Nachman's statement, and he says, Aini, and is it so that collectors may seize pledges? Right, meaning someone made a pledge. So let's go, pay it up. No. What do we say? He's busy. You can't bother him. Gemara says, yes, you can bother him. He's busy doing a mitzvah. You still need you still need two, and they can bother him. So the Gemara says, v'hoksiv, it says, v'fakadati, I'll call lo chatzav, and I will visit evil upon all of their oppressors. Amr Rav Yitzchak Bar Shmuel, Rav Yitzchak, the son of Shmuel, the son of Marta, Mishmei the Rav, said in the name of Rav, v'afilu al gabay tzdaka, and God will visit evil upon charity collectors, since collecting that which the people are willing to give is not oppressive, indeed, it is a great service to the community. Rav Yitzchak must mean that the collectors occasionally oppress the people by overzealously seizing their property for collateral, and for that they will be punished. We see then that collectors are forbidden to seize pledges for unpaid charity obligations. So there's a known thing. I just want to share uh, just a thought for a second. You know, whenever someone makes a pledge to an organization, you know, right now we're in the middle of our campaign at Torch and people make pledges. People say, you know what, count me in this year. I'm in for 5,000, 10,000, 100,000, God willing, right? (laughs) But, you know, a million dollars or even $10, I'm going to send you a check. Now, what happens if they forgot to send that check? So I always make sure that I myself, if I make a pledge or if I'm receiving a pledge from someone else, that it's blinader without a promise. Because one of the worst things a person can do is make a pledge and not fulfill it. But if it's without a promise, meaning if I get a chance, if I get, if I have the means, I'll do it. But if not, I'm not, I don't want to be held accountable. And this happens many times on Shabbos. On Shabbos, people purchase aliyahs in shul the re- why because they want a they want the they want the honor 
either for themselves or they want to honor somebody else. Oh, it's their birthday. I'm going to buy an aliyah for that guy. Uh, it, it's someone is, uh, it's someone's anniversary. I'm going to buy an aliyah for them or whatever it is. So the, the idea is, is that, yeah, we want to do it, but on, on Shabbos, we can't write. On Shabbos, we can't notate our, our account, uh, on online that we should send the contribution to the synagogue. So comes after Shabbos and we're busy with a thousand other things. We may have forgotten to make that pledge, to fulfill that pledge. And that could be very problematic, which is why it's proper for, for someone to say, Bli neder without a promise. Now, it could be theft because imagine this. Imagine this. There are, there are a few people bidding on a specific honor. So let's say they say, okay, Shlishi, you can't Cohen and Levi usually only if there's more than one Cohen, then they can auction it. But if there's one Cohen, many shuls only have one Cohen, so you don't auction that, you have to give it to him. And Levi as well. So that's that. So they start from the third aliyah, that's usually where they start auctioning. So imagine someone's auctioning, he says, uh, $18. The next guy says $36. The next guy says $54. Now you are the maybe guy. You're the blean edder without a promise guy. And you say, okay, $100. And then you outbid everybody else. So now the other guys maybe would have paid their pledge. But you're saying, well, if I remember, I'll pay it. If I don't remember, then what's the big deal? No, 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 no. That means you could be held accountable for the pledges that other people would have given that you overrode now with your pledge that you're not going to fulfill. Well, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Person has to be very, very careful. When you make a promise, you have to fulfill your promise. Now, when I came to Torch 19 years ago, and I I, I inherited an organization from my predecessor, and uh, we were in the middle of a lot of things. I suddenly started getting phone calls from the hotel where they did the the uh, dinner a few months prior, saying, uh, you know, you guys have an outstanding bill. And then I get a phone call from the printer. You know, you guys have an outstanding bill. And you I call it one after another after another. I start getting all of these things. And I, what I told them was like this. I said, listen, I just took over this organization. And I don't know yet how I'm going to pay these bills. But I want to meet with you because I want to reassure you that I will pay these bills. We're an organization of integrity. We're an organization of reliability. And if a pledge was made on behalf of this organization to pay a bill, we will pay it. And I met with each of them and shook their hand. And I said, I thank you for doing business with our organization. And I appreciate if you'll be able to be patient with us. And every one of the vendors told me, you're the first person to ever do that for me. She said, usually when they have such a turnover, they like try to erase the bill. They're like, sorry, I didn't make this I this agreement with you. It was a previous person. And therefore, I'm not responsible for what they pledged. You can run after them personally, but I'm not going to take responsibility. He said, here, you came down to my office and you told me that you acknowledged this, this bill that you have outstanding and you took full responsibility. He says, as much time as you need, you have it. And anytime, they, later on, they said, anytime you want to do business with me, we're happy to do business with you because we want someone who's trustworthy. And eventually, we paid them all down, thank God. We paid up all the debts, and thank God we've been debt-free since. But the idea here is, is that we have to undertake the responsibility, financial responsibility that we owe someone something. It needs to be fulfilled completely and cannot, under any circumstances, be blown off. I remember as a child, we were taught this in school, that if someone is one of the reasons that someone comes and is reincarnated, to pay back debts that they didn't pay. It's a very severe thing. If someone leaves this world and they owe someone $50, they're going to have to come back here to repay that $50. Yes. That's why I, every once in a while... I give donations to the yeshivas I used to go to, I used to learn at, because I'm afraid if I damaged the desk, if I wrote on the, I wrote with a marker, or I broke a wall and made a hole in a wall, whatever it may be, I damaged their property. I owe them that money, even though I was a child. 
So I'll send them $100. Just like I don't want to come back here as a little cat to have to pay you back. You know what I mean? I I'd prefer not. So, you know, so it, that's not worth it. Either way, it's a very serious thing because Hashem gives an allotment of funds and resources to each individual. And when we take away the allotment that someone is supposed to have, it's not liked upon by the Almighty. Okay. So now the Gemara asks, how is it possible you're saying that these collectors can go and seize assets for the debts that people have to charity? We know that God refers to them as evil and God's going to pay them back for, pay them back negatively in a negative way for mistreating people and going after them for, um, for collecting those, uh, those debts. So the Gemara replies, Lo kashio. No, it's not difficult. Ho de amid ho de lo amid. This law of Rab Nachman applies when the contributor is wealthy and has not contributed what he is capable of giving. But the law of Rab Yitzchak applies, meaning the law where he says that I, even charity collectors will be faced with evil reprimand if they go after them. That's referring to when they're not wealthy and they don't have the funds and you're still coming after them and you're choking them. That means there's a difference of how we apply the law based on the resources the individual has. So if a person really has and they're just playing games, so that's a big problem and you can go after them. But if they are not capable, they're poor, they lost their... Yeah, I'll just, I want to tell you an amazing story. There's the two people came once to a village back in Europe and they went to the cemetery. Cemetery is where we go as Jews. We go when we go visit a city. Unfortunately in Europe, there's no more nothing left of the cities. There's only cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries. So you go to the cemetery and they go to the cemetery and they see that outside of the main cemetery there's a grave. And on the tombstone it says, over here lived Yasala the miser, the holy miser. Yasala the holy miser. Right next to him is the rabbi's tombstone outside of the cemetery. It's like they had an annex. They had to annex it, add it to the cemetery. What happened? So they go into the, to the shtetl, into the village, and they ask the, the rabbi, what's going on? What's the story here? See, so he says, let me tell you. There was a, a, a very, very wealthy man who was a known miser. This Yasala. Very, very known how much money he had. He didn't give money to anybody. He says every single time there was a poor person, the poor person said, you know what, I'm going to go to Yasala, even though he's a miser and everybody, my story is going to be different and I'm going to be able to persuade him to give me. Okay. So everyone says, good luck, good luck. He comes into the house and Yasala would greet him nicely. He'd be like, wow, come inside, come inside, let me help you. You know, what do you need? And he would he would open up a table for him and give him fine, delicious delicacies, you know, and while he's listening to everything that he needs, he'd say, you know, I was, uh, you know, I got injured or I lost my job and so on and so forth. How many children do you have? And he would inquire lovingly and kindly about each of these poor people. And one at a time, he would listen to their to their sorrows. And then he would say, and, and where do you live? And he would get his address. And then he would say, and, and, and how much money do you need? And he would say, oh, I need, uh, he says, you know, for my family and for our, you know, our, our upkeep, this is what we would need. And then suddenly his kind, beautiful face would turn into a face of anger. And he would grab this poor person and say, and you think you're going to get this from me? And he would throw him out of the house. Don't ever come back here again. Wow. And then the next poor person would come, think he would change his, the mazel, he would change his luck, and the same thing would happen. The same thing would happen to each and every poor person. Now, what happened was, is that when Yasala was on his deathbed, the people from the community, the authorities of the community said, listen, Yasala, we all know that you have money. And we need you to pay for your own burial. He says, I don't know, I'm not giving you anything. They said, listen, if you don't give us from your own burial, for your own burial, we're not going to bury you. So 
He said, I don't care. I don't, I don't, I, I, I can't give you. And sure enough, he died on, a, I think it was on a Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. And they uh, didn't bury him. No one wanted to bury him. We're not going to bury him. But the rabbi had a dream that this was not just Yassel or the miser, but this was the holy miser. He was a very, very special person. Why? Because what happened? Wednesday morning came around and poor people started knocking on the doors of the rabbi, one after another after another. And he's like, what's going on? He says, I, 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 don't, I don't have money. What do you mean you don't have money? What did you do last week? He says, I don't know. Last week, I would get an envelope under the door with cash. And one after another, people were complaining that that envelope wasn't coming anymore. And then the rabbi realized that when he threw them out, he wanted them to not know that he was the one that was going to be supporting them. And he would put every Wednesday morning, because that's when you start preparing for Shabbos, he would put an envelope under each door he would get all the information of how much money they needed. He would get the information of where they lived and he would put the envelope under the door. And this Wednesday morning, they didn't get that envelope. Thursday morning, even more people would come to the rabbi. You know, we don't have any money. We don't have, you know, our support is gone. And they realized that it wasn't Yasala, the Kamsen, Yasala, the miser, but it was Yasala, the very, very holy miser. And he was already buried outside of the cemetery. But the tombstone, they made sure that they did correctly. The rabbi said, to honor this holy miser, I'm going to be buried next to him. And the rabbi was buried next to him. And generations later, the story was always told about Yassel, the holy miser. We never know what someone has, what someone doesn't have, and we never know what someone is giving to. I can tell you myself that I have been privy to information about charity contributions that people gave i'm involved not only in torch as an organization but i'm involved in many communal matters involved in in some of the tom shabbos and supporting people who don't have food for shabbos and supporting many different projects and there are many people who no one would ever know are funding institutions and funding projects and funding poor people that they walk around and they drive the simplest cars and they, they walk around, you don't, they're not wearing nice clothes, nice, you know, uh, real brand names, designer clothes, simple, simple people. And these sometimes are the most righteous of people. They don't want anyone to know about their kindness. They don't want anyone to know about the things that they're doing. They just want to be private. And people go to them Sometimes it's for loans, for private loans. People, you know, have a, a family a, a event coming up. They have a bar mitzvah. They have a wedding. They have a bris. They have a whatever it is, a bat mitzvah, and they they need it. They don't have the extra funds. They go and people who know know that there's some people you can rely on. That even though they look simple, they look like they're not well to do. They're the ones who are helping constantly. Every institution that needs assistance, every individual that needs assistance knows that they have. And this is a special part of the Jewish people is that we don't need to announce everything. We give things anonymously many, many times. Sometimes people like their names on things. That's fine. That's also fine. But when people do it with the heart, that's what's most important. It needs to be with the heart. I have many stories to share on this matter, but we need to continue the Talmud. Any questions so far? No, you need to have three people on the committee, and the Gemara is going to explain why. The Gemara is going to explain why you specifically need three. Um, it's it's important. For other matters, yes. Usually we, we go by majority, majority rules. Um, I, I'll, I'll just tell you a, a quick story. My great aunt, may she live and be well, her name is Bambi, and she was the head midwife of Shari Tzedek Hospital in Jerusalem. I've said this story a very, very long time ago. So if you don't, if if you heard it before, I apologize. We have some. Hey, so she she was delivering babies every night. She never, unfortunately, she never had any of her own children, and she would be in the hospital delivering baby after baby every night on night shift for fifty years. She delivered over fifty thousand babies. 
She delivered me and she delivered my son. My son Dovi was born in in, in Shari Tzedek Hospital in Jerusalem, and uh, she she delivered she delivered some of my siblings as well in the United States. Like my, I remember my mother was once going into labor, and she and she was visiting there collecting for her charity Bambi. So my mother says, "Why don't you come to the hospital with me and you deliver the baby?" So my mother says to the doctor, this young doctor probably delivered sixteen babies, and he says to uh, to like, "What are your qualifications?" She says, "Whatever, I only delivered like." At the time, probably thirty-five thousand babies. She's like, "Oh, I'm sorry. You please go right ahead." You know, it's like so. Um, it, it really, an unbelievable woman. But one of the things that she would hear from the ladies who were giving birth is sometimes women were facing challenges at home with finances, a poor family, having a baby, and mother would be crying. I don't know how I'm going to support the baby. I don't know where we're going to have money from. Either way. So she started a Matan Beseter, which is giving anonymously, an organization that is such a holy organization because you'd give money to the organization and the organization would distribute it anonymously. Nobody knew. So the giver doesn't know who's the recipient. The recipient does not know who's the giver. And they would support hundreds of families that needed on a regular basis, a little bit more for the holidays, for basic necessities. A very, very special organization. She was here in Houston a couple of times. And we had a fundraiser for her. Uh, I, I, I want to dedicate the learning that we learned today to her honor and to her you know, well-being, that she should be well. She should live many, many, many years in good health. I mean, she's already retired from the hospital and um, Hashem should give her continued strength. So now the Talmud continues. Right. So, so look, pe- pe- people have to be right. So, people have to be responsible. That's for sure. I'll tell. I'll tell you. I had a guy who came over to me one time. He says, "Rabbi, I need to meet with you immediately." He says, "I'm about to close." He, we met at Starbucks. And I remember this as, as clear as day. You remember the story I told you. And he says, "I'm about to close a deal. I need your blessing." And I close the deal. I'm going to give you fifty thousand dollars. And uh, sure enough. I didn't hear from him after that. And I met him a long time later. I'm like, he's avoiding my phone calls. And uh, he told me that, um, you know, yeah, we closed the deal. And uh, and I decided I, instead of giving you that money, I'm going to invest it for you. I knew right away, I knew right away that, that it was it was not a genuine, it was not a genuine pledge. And some people like... <laughs> I believe in his heart he really meant it. He really meant it. But in reality he couldn't he couldn't hold up to it. So, you know, what do you do? That's what you do. You know, what can you do? That's the way it is. Either way, Hashem has been very, very, very gracious with us and very kind with us. That you know what? When someone says that they can't, we accept it and we will acknowledge them just as kindly as we would, to me, it doesn't make a difference if someone gives a million dollars or gives zero dollars. Every person gets the same type of treatment. We, we smile and we greet them warmly and lovingly regardless of their financial status and regardless of their financial capability. That's not what we're here for. Look, yeah, there, there, are, there, are, there are organizations that will run after you till your death to, to, to get you to pay that $10 pledge that you still owe them. But it's, uh, it is what it is. Okay, either way, we have to learn the Torah teaches us to, to be considerate of others. And that's what we need to, to be very, very conscious of. The Gemara relates an incident to illustrate that wealthy people are treated differently. Kihod de Rava. There was a story once with Rava. And we see that rich, the rich may even be compelled to contribute from this story. Ichpe liravnasan bar ami. When Rava was collecting uh, for charity, he coerced Ravnasan bar ami, who was a very wealthy man, 
Vishokur mine arba meo zuzil tzdaka. And he took from Rav Nassan 400 zuzim for charity. Similarly, collectors are permitted to seize collateral from wealthy contributors. So we see that he was, he went after him, meaning not after him. We, we think of it going after him as like we're going to pursue them. He went and he, he was able to collect from him 400 zuzim for charity. Why? Because he was a wealthy guy. Someone who can do more should give more. Someone who can do less uh, gives less. The Gemara extols the virtue of charity collectors. Okay, so this is for anybody who has issues with torch collecting money. Just know that the, there's some virtue to it. Okay. And the wise will shine like the radiance of the firmament. This refers to a judge well, who's going to have be, going to shine like the radiance of a firmament. A judge who renders an absolutely truthful judgment. His virtue will cause him to shine. The Gemara expounds upon the end of the verse. And those who make the many righteous, meaning those who bring merits to others, they will shine like the stars forever and ever. And who is that? Elu This is referring to the charity collectors, who, in the merit of causing the many to be charitable, will shine like the stars. So there is, we think, many times, and I said this, I was someplace this week, and we were talking as a group, you know, that people come and collect charity in our homes, in our neighborhood, people knocking almost every single day. Knocking, one is collecting for a charity in Israel, and one is for collecting. For, I had a guy came to me this week from Colombia. He runs the Jewish, Jewish institution. It's an orphanage. It's a school. It's a, it's a synagogue. It's all, all in one. It's a study, like a torch center out there in Colombia. And he's collecting funds. And a mikvah. All, it's like a one big community center taking care of all the needs of the community. He came here to collect money. See, so we were talking, discussing among among friends. We were talking, and someone stressed an irritation that they had. Oh, people are knocking on my door every day. I said, you don't understand. Do you know who's really knocking at your door? Hashem is knocking at your door. And we brought that Rabbeinu Bechayi, Rabbeinu Bechayi, in the introduction to Parshas Kisavo in Deuteronomy. He says that when someone is knocking on your door for charity, it's the Almighty knocking at your door for charity. You have the opportunity to greet the Almighty and to show what type of kindness you want from the Almighty. We knock on the Almighty's door all the time. The Almighty says, okay, let's switch roles now. Now I'm going to be the, I'm, I'm dressed up like a guy from Colombia collecting for an institution. No, it's really me. Hashem, let me see how gracious and how kind you are. So, it's not always pleasant to be on the asking side, but the Gemara is encouraging that if you can, get involved in your synagogue, get involved in your JCC, get involved in your uh, federation, APAC, you name the institution, get involved in something. By the way, everyone's welcome to help Torch, but get involved and don't be afraid to ask. You're giving someone else the merit that they can support a good cause. You're giving someone else the privilege and the opportunity. And if they yell at you, you'll, your level of reward goes up a notch. The Gemara presents a different version of the above. Bimasni Satana. It was taught in a brisa, and the wise will shine like the radiance of the firmament. What does that mean? This is referring to a judge who renders an absolutely truthful judgment and to charity collectors. And the second part of the verse, which says that those who make the many righteous will shine like the stars forever and ever. Who is that referring to? Elu Melamde Tinokos. Those are referring to the school teachers who teach the children Torah. 
That is, by the way, not frequently rewarded appropriately. It's not common that a rabbi who's teaching the school children every day, it's a grind, first grade, second grade, you're teaching them how to read the Aleph Bet, you're teaching them their first verses in the Torah, you're teaching them the first Mishnah they learn, you're teaching them the first Talmud that they learn. It's a grind. It's not easy. It's not always rewarding. You don't always see the results till they are out of high school and you see them in yeshiva studying. It takes many, many years to see the, the fruits of your labor. Guess what? That reward may not come in this world, but in the world to come, that you will shine forever and ever like the stars. That is a great reward. The Gemara asks, Kigon Man, who is an example that fits the description of such a teacher? Amarav, Rav says, Kigon Rav Shmuel Bar Shilas, a teacher such as Rav Shmuel Bar Shilas, who is extremely dedicated to, to his students, such a teacher is going to shine like the stars forever and ever. The Gemara relates an incident that instilla- in- that illustrates Rav Shmuel's extraordinary dedication. The Rav Ashkeche le Rav Shmuel bar Shilas de Haviko Beginsa. For Rav once found Rav, Rav Shmuel bar Shilas standing in a garden, Omer Leish Shvakti. Lehim Nusach, Rav said to him, have you abandoned your trust, meaning your children? Amar Lehi, Rav Shmuel said to Rav, Ha tleisar shnin de chazili. It has been 13 years that I have not seen this garden. Vehashto nami daita alio, alvoyu. And even now my mind is on the children that I teach Torah. I haven't seen this garden 13 years. But even now that I'm here by this garden, I am still thinking about my students. Rav Shmuel was so dedicated that he taught and supervised his students constantly. Rav was therefore amazed to see Rav Shmuel alone away from his students. According to Rabbeinu Gershom, Rav questioned whether Rav Shmuel had quit his job. What is it referred to when it says he was in his garden? He was so busy with his students, he didn't even take time off to tend to his own garden. His own flowers, his own plants, he didn't take the time. He was busy with his students all day. Okay. A teacher who always thinks of his students is truly making the many, the future generations, righteous. And therefore, he will shine like the stars forever. I want to share with you an incredible story that one of the rabbis who was teaching in a day school, in a yeshiva in Israel, was very frustrated with one of his students and he wanted to throw the student out of school. He was misbehaving, acting in a way that was not appropriate for the school. So he went to one of the leading rabbis of the Jewish people, Reb Aaron Leib Steinman. Reb Aaron Leib was known for his soft, delicate, compassionate nature. And... He listens to what the rabbi says. And he says to him, what's the student's name? Oh, sorry, what's the student's mother's name? So he says, the, the, the mother, no, I'm talking about the student. He says, no, 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 no. What's the student's mother's name? He says, I have no idea. He says, you mean to tell me you have a student that you're considering to throw out of yeshiva? And you've never davened for the student? You've never prayed for the well-being of the student? You never prayed for the success of that student? He says, if you haven't prayed for that student, you haven't even begun teaching that student. Very powerful lesson. I want you to know that my students are privileged to have rabbis and teachers, rabbis and teachers here in our school in Houston that every year before the school year, they send out a survey to the parents asking for the parent's name as well. Not only the child's name, but what's the parent's name? Because now every teacher has a list of their students to pray for them. You know what? The, the child has behavior issues in class. Why don't you pray for the student? Pa- Sometimes teachers are just like, I don't want the problem in my class. Not my problem. No, 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 no. You're there to be their mentor and their guide to help them. Maybe they're facing a struggle. 
Maybe they're facing a life challenge. Maybe the parents are going through a divorce. Maybe they just moved homes. Maybe there's something that's traumatic for the child that you know don't know about. As a rabbi who's caring and concerning, pray for your student. I want you to know that I pray for every single one of the torch students. Not only those who are here in the class today and those who are listening, I do. I pray because everyone needs success. Everyone needs assistance. And you know what? I also pray, pray for their livelihood, for their success, because that's part. We're a family here. We're a family here. It's not like I have my job, you have your job. No, 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 no. We're one team. And we're united, one another. Yes. The Christians who say, I pray for you, is I pray that you come to the recognition of my Lord and Savior and that you accept him. That's what they pray for. No, 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 no. No, it's not that simple. I pray that every person succeed and maximize their potential in every area of life. In their marriage, they should be successful. By the way, I've had people come to me and tell me here in this Torch Center, say, Rabbi, I've had enough. I want to divorce my husband. I want to divorce my wife. I wanted this. I wanted that. You know what I do? I don't have the answers. I go and I pray for them. I go and I pray for them. What else can I do? I don't have the, the magic bullet. I don't have the answers. I have no idea what to do. What am I supposed to say? I pray for them. Yes, there are some special people out there. There's no question. There's some special people out there that, that yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now after revealing the tremendous honors these worthy people will receive, the Gemara asks for Rabbon on Mai, and what is written about the rabbis who study Torah constantly? What's their reward? We know about the school teachers. We know about those who collect charity. We know about those who give truthful judgment. But what's about the Torah scholars? The Gemara answers on Ravina. Ravina said that the honor to be accorded the rabbis is described in the following verse. The Ohavav Ketseis Hashemesh Bigvuraso. But those who love Hashem shall be as the sun going forth in its might. The light that Torah scholars merit is the most brilliant light by far. So here's the amazing thing. I don't know if I'm a Torah scholar, but I know that I spend a lot of time teaching Torah. And this organization, imagine teaching Torah, having students, and being a collector of charity all in one. You get all of those merits by supporting Torch. Isn't that incredible? Hopefully we're Torah scholars. Hopefully I try. I, I, I every day try to learn more and more to advance my knowledge of Torah, to teach students, which we do, plentiful of that, and to be collecting charity. I'm not a judge yet, but um, I think it's a very, very special thing that people can uh, can support us. I want to share with you now the next Gemara. The Gemara discusses various laws designed to protect the reputation of charity collectors. Very important. Being transparent and being extra cautious with every single penny. And I'll show you why the Gemara says here. Tana Rabbanon. We've brought this example many, many times. But now we're going to learn it inside. Tana Rabbanon. The rabbis taught in a b'risa. Gabay tztaka enon rishayim lifrosh ze'ezeh. Charity collectors are not permitted to separate from one another while collecting. For one person collecting alone might be suspected of stealing. Aval poresh ze lishar vize lechanos. However, this one may split off to the gate and this one may split off to the store. So long as both are seen together, they will arouse no suspicions. Meaning if they're, if they're visible to one another and people recognize that they're together, they're not going to assume that one is going to steal right in front of the other guy. One is by the entrance and one is inside the store. That's not, you're not going to suspect that they are stealing. A second ruling. Matzamos bashik ushbashuk. If a charity collector finds coins in the marketplace while collecting, so he's collecting charity for the charity, whatever cause it is, and while he's there, he finds twenty dollars on the floor. 
Lo yitnem betoch kiso. He must not put them into his pocket, lest observers suspect that he is stealing money that belongs to the charity. Ela no sin letoch arniki shel tzdoka. Rather, he should put it the coins into the charity funds purse, and then when he reaches his home, he may take that that money. Similarly, if a charity collector was owed a money, so you loan someone money. You loan someone money. You're the charity collector. You loan someone privately. You loan them $100. Now they come. You're in the marketplace collecting the charity, and they say, oh, I, I was looking for you. I wanted to give you back your $100. Thank you so much for loaning me the money. Here's the $100. Now I'm going to put it in my private pocket. It's going to look to the onlooker that it's going to be me taking the money, putting it in my own pocket, money that was designated to charity. She says, Do not put the money into your own pocket. Rather, you should put the money into the charity fund's purse. And then when he reaches his home, he may take his payment. Why? So that it shouldn't look like something which is unscrupulous, something which is untrustworthy. It shouldn't look like he's playing games with the funds of charity. This is a very, very powerful thing for us to realize that there needs to be in an organization that collects charity, in any charity, there needs to be oversight. Oversight, not because we suspect, so that people should be able to rely on it. People should know this money is being handled appropriately because there there is oversight and therefore we have confidence that it's being done properly. And so that the people who are collecting the funds should not, should, again, should not be suspected by others of being dishonest. Because that's the biggest fear. The biggest fear is that someone's going to say, oh, you know this Walby guy, I don't think you should trust him because there's no oversight. Like this, people know there is oversight and there's an internal audit annually and there's someone who's overlooking everything. Oh, that's something I can trust. And that's very important. It's very, very important for us to have the proper oversight over the things that go on in every institution, in every charity. So now the Gemara quotes another Brisa that further instructs how to protect the reputation of charity collectors. Tona Rabban on the rabbis taught in a Brisa. Administrators of a charity fund that have no poor people to whom to distribute money and thus are left holding the surplus of coins in the fund. So now they raised $100,000. They only needed 50000 at the end. Now they have an extra $50,000 sitting in the fund and they don't have poor people to support anymore because thank God everyone's got a job and everyone's got a fine livelihood. Now what do they do with that surplus of money? Portin le'acherim, they should exchange the copper coins for other people. But may not exchange them for themselves, lest people suspect that the collectors are allowing themselves a favorable exchange rate and are thereby stealing from the charity fund. So you want to pull it out of cash, right? You don't want to sit there with dollar bills. You want to put it into a, uh, we put it into the into the account of the, uh, right? Or put it into coins that the, those days they didn't have banks. So they'd put it into bigger coins, but what's the rate for those coins, for those silver coins, the copper coins, whatever it was? So the exchange rate, you wanted to make sure that it was in general, by the way, if someone is being asked to exchange money, to take out money from a charity, you don't, it's the same thing, by the way. The halacha says that if someone is in the marketplace and they're the charity, per, the person giving out, give, collecting charity or giving out the charity, they can't exchange it from their own pocket. They should, ex- right, it, you have to be very careful. Similarly, administrators of a communal platter that have no poor people to whom to distribute the foods that was collected, the food that was collected, should sell the surplus food to others and hold the proceeds for purchasing for other food as needed. But they do not sell it to themselves, for they may be suspect of buying a deflated 
price. So let me give you an example. Perfect. I have a great example for this. So what happens, we, we as Torch, as an organization, uh, we used to do dinners. You remember those dinners? Oh, beautiful dinners. Yeah. And the reason we don't do it because it's not profitable anymore. It's not the, the way we do the current fundraiser is such a low cost to run such a fundraiser online. You do a fundraising dinner, it's a massive expense. It's not, it, and it's, it's mum and hegdish. It's holy money. It's money of the community. We, there's no justification for spending such kind of money. So what would we do? We would order wine and we would order a lot of things that had to go through proper channels for TABC, for the uh, alcohol and whatever beverage commission. So you had to order it through the hotel. But when you let, we had leftover wine bottles. What do you do now with all those leftover wine bottles? So I would love to be able to buy that wine. Right? We bought it wholesale. You can buy it from, from Torch and then use it for my own self. But the Allah says here, the Talmud says, you're not allowed to do that. You can sell it to other people, but you can't sell it to yourself. Why? Because people might suspect that, oh, he's giving himself a discount on it. Instead of it being $10 a bottle or $20 a bottle, he's buying it for half price from his own organization, meaning from his own charity. Got it? You understand the case? The idea is that it should be transparency and nobody should ever come to a point where they can suspect that you're doing something more favorable for yourself than if you were selling it to someone else. Right, right. So again, if there's transparency, meaning let's say you have the two cases of wine, you put it on the table, you have a board, you say, listen, I want to know if I can buy this at the fair market value. Right? And if they agree, then it's like buying it like anyone else's. But the idea is you shouldn't be doing this as a, like me, myself, I'm just going to I'll put some money in the charity box. Nobody knows and take the bottles and bring them home. That's, you got to be very, very careful of that because that could be looked at as suspicious behavior. And we want to make sure that members who collect charity are on the up and up of integrity, that no one can even suspect that they were doing something which was questionable. So now the Brisa teaches a third law, Maos shall stoker ein monen osan steim steim. Charity funds should not be counted two coins at a time, elo achas achas, rather they should be counted one by one to avoid giving the appearance of a dishonest accounting. Okay, you got to be very careful of that. What does that mean? That means that if a person is counting Coins, you know, we count coins. Sometimes we count them two at a time. You count them two at a time, so it goes faster. Not with charity money. Charity money, you count one at a time. So nobody should suspect that you're counting it inaccurately. So my dear friends, it's a very big responsibility that each and every one of us have to ensure that we are really, really, really careful with our own reputation as well as the reputation of it, of any charity that when we are dealing with money of the public, that we are doing so with utmost caution. That not only we shouldn't do something which is dishonest, we shouldn't do something that looks to be dishonest. That's how careful we need to be. So, my dear friends, have a magnificent Shabbos. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope and pray that we continue to succeed in our Torah study and in our teaching of Torah and in our collecting of charity, and our giving truthful judgment, because those who do these four things have the eternal light of the Almighty shining on them, and we all want to be part of that. My dear friends, have a great Shabbos. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom.